Our Lady of the Sorrow Pods by Robert Silverberg. Twenty-one August, oh seven fifty hours. Ten minutes since the module meltdown. I can't see the wreckage from here, but I can smell it, bitter and sour against the moist tropical air. I've found a cleft in the rocks, a kind of shallow cavern where I'll be safe from the dinosaurs for a while. It's shielded by thick clumps of cicads, and in any case, it's too small for the big predators to enter. But sooner or later, I'm going to need food, and then what? I have no weapons. How long can one woman last, stranded and more or less helpless aboard Dino Island, a habitat unit not quite fifteen hundred meters in diameter, that she's sharing with a bunch of active, hungry dinosaurs? I keep telling myself that none of this is really happening. Only I can't quite convince myself of this. My escape still has me shaky. I can't get out of my mind the funny little bubbling sound the tiny power pack made as it began to overheat. In something like 14 seconds, my lovely mobile module became a charred heap of fused-together junk, taking with it my communicator unit, my food supply, my laser gun, and, and just about everything else. But for the warning that funny little sound gave me, I'd be so much charred junk too. Better off that way, most likely. When I close my eyes, I imagine I can see Habitat Vronsky floating serenely in orbit, a mere 120 kilometers away. What a beautiful sight! The walls gleaming like platinum, the great mirror collecting sunlight and flashing it into the windows, the agricultural satellites wheeling around it like a dozen tiny moons. I could almost reach out and touch it, tap on the shielding, and murmur, "Help me! Come for me! Rescue me!" But I might just as well be out beyond Neptune as sitting here in the adjoining Lagrange slot. There's no way I can call for help. The moment I move outside this protective cleft in the rock, I'm at the mercy of my saurians, and their mercy is not likely to be tender. Now it's beginning to rain, artificial like practically everything else on Dino Island, but it gets you just as wet as the natural kind, and just as clammy. Oof! Jesus, what am I going to do? Oh eight, fifteen hours. The rain is over for now. It'll come again in six hours. Astonishing how muggy, dank, thick the air is. Simply breathing is hard work, and I feel as though mildew is forming on my lungs. I miss Vronsky's clear, crisp, everlasting springtime air. On previous trips to Dino Island, I never cared about the climate, but of course I was snugly englobed in my mobile unit. A world within a world, self-contained, self-sufficient, isolated from all contact with this place and its creatures, merely a roving eye, traveling as I pleased, invisible, invulnerable. Can they sniff me in here? We don't think their sense of smell is very acute, and the stink of the burned wreckage dominates the place at the moment. But I must reek with fear signals. I feel calm now, but it was different when I got out of the module. Scattered pheromones all over the place. I bet. Ugh, commotion in the thickets. Something's coming in here. Long neck, small bird-like feet, delicate grasping hands. Not to worry. Struthiomimus is all. Dainty dino, fragile bird-like critter, barely two meters high. Liquid golden eyes staring solemnly at me. It swivels its head from side to side, ostrich-like. Click click. As if trying to make up its mind about coming closer to me, scat! Go peck a stegosaur. Let me alone. It withdraws, making little clucking sounds. Closest I've ever been to a live dinosaur. Glad it was one of the little ones. Oh, nine hundred hours. Getting hungry. What am I going to eat? They say roasted cicad cones aren't too bad. How about raw ones? So many plants are edible when cooked and poisonous otherwise. I never studied such things in detail. Living in our antiseptic little L5 habitats, we're not required to be outdoors wise after all. Anyway, there's a fleshy-looking cone on the cicad just in front of the cleft, and it's got an edible look. Might as well try it raw because there's no other way. Rubbing sticks together will get me nowhere. Getting the cone off takes some work. Wiggle, twist. Snap, tear, there. Not as fleshy as it looks. Chewy, in fact. It's a little like munching on rubber. 
Decent flavor, though. And maybe some useful carbohydrate. The shuttle isn't due to pick me up for 30 days. Nobody's apt to come looking for me or even think about me before then. I'm on my own. Nice irony there. I was desperate to get out of Vronsky and escape from all the bickering and maneuvering, the endless meetings and memoranda, the fainting and counterfeinting, all the ugly political crap that scientists indulge in when they turn into administrators. Thirty days of blessed isolation on Dino Island. An end to that constant dull throbbing in my head from the daily infighting with Director Sarber. Pure research again. And then the meltdown. And here I am, cowering in the bushes, wondering which comes first, starving or getting gobbled by some cloned tyrannosaur. Oh, 0930 hours. Funny thought just now. Could it have been sabotage? Consider. Sarber and I feuding for weeks over the issue of opening Dino Island to tourists. Crucial staff vote coming up next month. Sarber says we can raise millions a year for expanded studies with a program of guided tours and perhaps some rental of the island to film companies. I say that's risky for the dinos and for the tourists, destructive of scientific values, a distraction, a sellout. Emotionally, the staff's with me. But Sarber waves figures around, shows fancy income projections, and generally shouts and blusters. Temper's running high. Sarber in lethal fury at being opposed, barely able to hide his loathing for me. Circulating rumors, designed to get back to me, that if I persist in blocking him, he'll abort my career. Which is malarkey, of course. He may outrank me, but he has no real authority over me. And then his politeness yesterday. Yesterday? An eon ago, smiling swarmily, telling me he hopes I'll rethink my position during my observation tour on the island, wishing me well. Had he gimmicked my power pack? I guess it isn't hard if you know a little engineering, and Sarber does. Some kind of timer set to withdraw the insulator rods? Wouldn't be any harm to Dino Island itself, just a quick, compact, localized disaster that implodes and melts the unit and its passenger. So sorry. Terrible scientific tragedy. What a great loss. And even if by some fluke I got out of the unit in time, my chances of surviving here as a pedestrian for 30 days would be pretty skimpy, right? Right. It makes me boil to think that someone would be willing to murder you over a mere policy disagreement. It's barbaric. Huh, worse than that, it's tacky. 11.30 hours. I can't stay crouched in this cleft forever. I'm going to explore Dino Island and see if I can find a better hideout. This one simply isn't adequate for anything more than short-term huddling. Besides, I'm not as spooked as I was right after the meltdown. I realize now that I'm not going to find a tyrannosaur hiding behind every tree. And even if I do, tyrannosaurs aren't going to be much interested in scrawny stuff like me. Anyway, I'm a quick-witted higher primate. If my humble mammalian ancestors 70 million years ago were able to elude dinosaurs well enough to survive and inherit the Earth, I should be able to keep from getting eaten for the next 30 days. And, with or without my cozy little mobile module, I want to get out into this place, whatever the risks. Nobody's ever had a chance to interact this closely with the dinos before. Good thing I kept this pocket recorder when I jumped from the module. Whether I'm a dino's dinner or not, I ought to be able to set down some useful observations. 1830 hours. Twilight is descending now. I am camped near the equator in a lean-to flung together out of tree fern fronds. A flimsy shelter, but the huge fronds conceal me, and with luck I'll make it through to morning. That sicked cone doesn't seem to have poisoned me yet, and I ate another one just now, along with some tender new fiddleheads uncoiling from the heart of a tree fern. Spartan fare, but it gives me the illusion of being fed. In the evening mists, I observe a brachiosaur, Half-grown, but already colossal, munching in the treetops. A gloomy-looking triceratops stands nearby, and several of the ostrich-like struthiomimids scamper busily in the underbrush, hunting I know not what. No sign of tyrannosaurs all day. 
There aren't many of them here anyway, and I hope they're all sleeping off huge feasts somewhere in the other hemisphere. What a fantastic place this is. I don't feel tired. I don't even feel frightened. Just a little wary. I feel exhilarated, as a matter of fact. Here I sit, peering out between fern fronds at a scene out of the dawn of time. What a brilliant idea it was to put all the Olsen processed dinosaur reconstructs aboard a little L5 habitat of their very own and turn them loose to recreate the Mesozoic. After that unfortunate San Diego event with the Tyrannosaur, it became politically unfeasible to keep them anywhere on Earth, I know. But even so, this is a better scheme. In just a little more than seven years, Dino Island has taken on an altogether convincing illusion of reality. Things grow so fast in this lush, steamy, high CO2 tropical atmosphere. Of course, we haven't been able to duplicate the real Mesozoic flora, but we've done all right using botanical survivors, cichids and tree ferns and horsetails and palms and jinkos and orocarias and thick carpets of mosses and selanginellas and liverworts covering the ground. Everything has blended and merged and run amuck. It's hard now to recall the bare and unnatural look of the island when we first laid it out. Now it's a seamless tapestry in green and brown, a dense jungle broken only by streams, lakes, and meadows, encapsulated in spherical metal walls some five kilometers in circumference. And the animals, the wonderful, fantastic, grotesque animals. We don't pretend that the real Mesozoic ever held any such mix of fauna as I've seen today. Stegosaurs and Carithosaurs side by side. A Triceratops sourly glaring at a Brachiosaur. Struthiomimus contemporary with Iguanodon. A wild, unscientific jumble of Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. A hundred million years of the dinosaur reign scrambled together. We take what we can get. Olsen process reconstructs require sufficient fossil DNA to permit the computer synthesis, and we've been able to find that in only some 20 species so far. The wonder is that we've accomplished even that much. To replicate the complete DNA molecule from battered and sketchy genetic information millions of years old, to carry out the intricate implants in reptilian host ova, to see the embryos through to self-sustaining levels. The only word that applies is miraculous. If our dinos come from eras millions of years apart, so be it. We do our best. If we have no pterosaur and no allosaur and no archaeopteryx, so be it. We may have them yet. What we already have is plenty to work with. Someday there may be separate Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous satellite habitats, but none of us will live to see that, I suspect total darkness now. Mysterious screechings and hissings out there. This afternoon, as I moved cautiously but in delight from the wreckage site up near the rotation axis to my present equatorial camp, sometimes coming within 50 or 100 meters of living dinos, I felt a kind of ecstasy. Now my fears are returning and my anger at the stupid marooning. I imagine clutching claws reaching for me terrible jaws yawning above me. I don't think I'll get much sleep tonight. 22 August, 0600 hours. Rosy-fingered dawn comes to Dino Island, and I'm still alive. Not a great night's sleep, but I must have had some, because I can remember fragments of dreams about dinosaurs, naturally, sitting in little groups, some playing pinochle and some knitting sweaters, and choral singing, a dinosaur rendition of the Messiah or Beethoven's Ninth. I don't remember which. I think I'm going nuts. I feel alert, inquisitive, and hungry, especially hungry. I know we've stocked this place with frogs and turtles and other small size anachronisms to provide a balanced diet for the big critters. Today I'll have to snare some for myself, grisly though I find the prospect of eating raw frog's legs. I don't bother getting dressed anymore. With rain showers programmed to fall four times a day, it's better to go naked anyway. 
Mother Eve of the Mesozoic, that's me. And without my soggy tunic, I find that I don't mind the greenhouse atmosphere of the habitat half as much as I did. Out to see what I can find. The dinosaurs are up and about already. The big herbivores munching away. The carnivores doing their stalking. All of them have such huge appetites that they can't wait for the sun to come up. In the bad old days when the dinos were thought to be reptiles, of course we'd have expected them to sit there like lumps until daylight got their body temperatures up to functional levels. But one of the great joys of the Reconstruct project was the vindication of the notion that dinosaurs were warm-blooded animals, active and quick and pretty damned intelligent. No sluggardly crocodilians these. Would that they were, if only for my survival's sake. 11.30 hours. A busy morning. My first encounter with a major predator. There are nine tyrannosaurs on the island, including three born in the past 18 months. That gives us an optimum predator-to-prey ratio. If the tyrannosaurs keep reproducing and don't start eating each other, we'll have to begin thinning them out. One of the problems with a closed ecology Natural checks and balances don't fully apply. Sooner or later, I was bound to encounter one, but I had hoped it would be later. I was hunting frogs at the edge of Cope Lake. A ticklish business. Calls for agility, cunning, quick reflexes. I remember the technique from my girlhood. The cupped hand, the lightning pounce, but somehow it's become a lot harder in the last 20 years. Superior frogs these days, I suppose. There I was, kneeling in the mud, swooping, missing, swooping, missing, some vast sauropod snoozing in the lake, probably our diplodocus, a corythosaur browsing in a stand of jinko trees, quite delicately nipping off the foul-smelling yellow fruits. Swoop, miss, swoop, miss. Such intense concentration on my task that old T-Rex could have tiptoed right up behind me and I'd have never noticed. But then I felt... A subtle something. A change in the air, maybe. A barely perceptible shift in dynamics. I glanced up and saw the corythosaur rearing on its hind legs. Looking around uneasily, pulling deep sniffs into that fantastically elaborate bony crest that houses its early warning system. Carnivore alert. The corythosaur obviously smelled something wicked this way coming, for it swung around between two big jinkos and started to go galumphing away too late. The treetops parted, giant boughs toppled, and out of the forest came our original tyrannosaur, the pigeon-toed one we called Belshazzar, moving in its heavy, clumsy waddle, ponderous legs working hard, tail absurdly swinging from side to side. I slithered into the lake and scrunched down as deep as I could go into the warm, oozing mud. The corythosaur had no place to slither. Unarmed, unarmored, it could only make great bleating sounds, terror mingled with defiance as the killer bore down on it. I had to watch. I had never actually seen a kill before. In a graceless but wondrously effective way, the tyrannosaur dug its hind claws into the ground, pivoted astonishingly, and, using its massive tail as a counterweight, moved in a 90-degree arc to knock the corythosaur down with a stupendous sideways swat of its huge head. I hadn't been expecting that. The corythosaur dropped and lay on its side, snorting in pain and feebly waving its limbs. Now came the coup de grace with hind legs, and then the rending and tearing, the jaws and the tiny arms at last coming into play, burrowing chin-deep in the mud. I watched in awe and weird fascination. There are those among us who argue that the carnivores ought to be segregated, put on their own island, that it is folly to allow reconstructs created with such effort to be casually butchered this way. Perhaps in the beginning that made sense, but not now. Not when natural increase is rapidly filling the island with young dinos. If we are to learn anything about these animals, it will only be by reproducing as closely as possible their original living conditions. Besides... Would it not be a cruel mockery to feed our tyrannosaurs on hamburger and herring? The killer fed for more than an hour. At the end came a scary moment. Belshazzar, blood-smeared and bloated, 
hauled himself ponderously down to the edge of the lake for a drink. He stood no more than ten meters from me. I did my most convincing imitation of a rotting log, but the Tyrannosaur, although it did seem to study me with a beady eye, had no further appetite. For a long while after he departed, I stayed buried in the mud, fearing he might come back for dessert. And eventually there was another crashing and bashing in the forest. Not Belshazzar this time, though, but a younger one with a gimpy arm. It uttered a sort of whinnying sound and went to work on the Corythosaur carcass. No surprise. We already knew from our observations that Tyrannosaurs had no prejudices against carrion. Nor, I found, did I. When the coast was clear, I crept out and saw that the two Tyrannosaurs had left hundreds of kilos of meat. Starvation knoweth no pride, and also few qualms. Using a clamshell for my blade, I started chopping away at the Corythosaur. Corythosaur meat has a curiously sweet flavor. Nutmeg and cloves, dash of cinnamon. The first chunk would not go down. You are a pioneer, I told myself, retching. You are the first human ever to eat dinosaur meat. Yes, but why does it have to be raw? No choice about that. Be dispassionate, love. Conquer your gag reflex or die trying. I pretended I was eating oysters. This time the meat went down. It didn't stay down. The alternative, I told myself grimly, is a diet of fern fronds. And you haven't been much good at catching the frogs. I tried again. Success. I'd have to call Corythosaur meat an acquired taste. But the wilderness is no place for picky eaters. 23 August, 1300 hours. At midday, I found myself in the southern hemisphere, along the fringes of Marsh Marsh, about a hundred meters below the equator. Observing herd behavior in sauropods, five brachiosaurs, two adult and three young, moving in formation, the small ones in the center. By small, I mean only some ten meters from nose to tail tip. The sauropod appetites being what they are, we'll have to thin that herd soon, too especially if we want to introduce a female Diplodocus into the colony. Two species of sauropods breeding and eating like that could devastate the island in three years. Nobody ever expected dinosaurs to reproduce like rabbits. Another dividend of their being warm-blooded, I suppose. We might have guessed it, though, from the vast quantity of fossils. If that many bones survived the catastrophes of a hundred-odd million years, how enormous the living Mesozoic population must have been. An awesome race in more ways than their mere physical mass. I had a chance to do a little herd thinning myself just now. Mysterious stirring in the spongy soil right at my feet, and I looked down to see Triceratops eggs hatching. Seven brave little critters, already horny and beaky, scrabbling out of a nest, staring around defiantly, no bigger than kittens, but active and sturdy from the moment they were born. The Corythosaur meat has probably spoiled by now. A more pragmatic soul very likely would have augmented her diet with one or two little Ceratopsians. I couldn't bring myself to do it. They scuttled off in seven different directions. I thought briefly of catching one and making a pet out of it. Silly idea. 25 August, 0700 hours. Start of the fifth day. I've done three complete circumambulations of Dino Island. Slinking around on foot is 50 times as risky as cruising around in a module, and 50,000 times as rewarding. I make camp in a different place every night. I don't mind the humidity any longer, and despite my skimpy diet, I feel pretty healthy. Raw dinosaur I know now is a lot tastier than raw frog. I've become an expert scavenger. The sound of a tyrannosaur in the forest now stimulates my salivary glands instead of my adrenals. Going naked is fun, too. And I appreciate my body much more since the bulges that civilization put there have begun to melt away. Nevertheless, I keep trying to figure out some way of signaling Habitat Vronsky for help. Changing the position of the reflecting mirrors, maybe, so I can beam an SOS? Sounds nice but I don't even know where the island's controls are located, let alone how to run them. Let's hope my luck holds out another three and a half weeks. 27 August, 
1,700 hours. The dinosaurs know that I'm here and that I'm some extraordinary kind of animal. Does that sound weird? How can great dumb beasts know anything? They have such tiny brains, and my own brain must be softening on this protein and cellulose diet. Even so, I'm starting to have peculiar feelings about these animals. I see them watching me, an odd, knowing look in their eyes, not stupid at all. They stare, and I imagine them nodding, smiling, exchanging glances with each other, discussing me. I'm supposed to be observing them, but I think they're observing me too, somehow. No, that's just crazy. I'm tempted to erase the entry. But I suppose I'll leave it as a record of my changing psychological state, if nothing else. 28 August, 1200 hours. More fantasies about the dinosaurs. I've decided that the big brachiosaur, Bertha, plays a key role here. She doesn't move around much, but there are always lesser dinosaurs in orbit around her. Much eye contact. Eye contact between dinosaurs? Let it stand. That's my perception of what they're doing. I get a definite sense that there's communication going on here, modulating over some wave that I'm not capable of detecting. And Bertha seems to be a central nexus, a grand totem of some sort, a... a switchboard? What am I talking about? What's happening to me? 30 August, 0945 hours. What a damn fool I am. Serves me right for being a filthy voyeur. Climbed a tree to watch iguanodons mating at the foot of Baker Falls. At the climactic moment, the branch broke. I dropped 20 meters. Grabbed a lower limb or I'd be dead now. As it is, pretty badly smashed around. I don't think anything's broken, but my left leg won't support me and my back's in bad shape. Internal injuries, too? Not sure. I've crawled into a little rock shelter near the falls. Exhausted and maybe feverish. Shock, most likely. I suppose I'll starve now. It would have been an honor to be eaten by a tyrannosaur. But to die from falling out of a tree is just plain humiliating. The mating of iguanodons is a spectacular sight, by the way. But I heard too much to describe it now. 31 August, 1700 hours. Stiff, sore, hungry, hideously thirsty. Legs still useless, and when I try to crawl even a few meters, I feel as if I'm going to crack in half at the waist. High fever. How long does it take to starve to death? 1 September, 0700 hours. Three broken eggs lying near me when I awoke. Embryos still alive, probably stegosaur, but not for long. First food in 48 hours. Did the eggs fall out of a nest somewhere overhead? Do stegosaurs make their nests in trees, dummy? Fever diminishing. Body aches all over. Crawled to the stream and managed to scoop up a little water. 13.30 hours. Dozed off. Awakened to find haunch of fresh meat within crawling distance. Strithiomimus drumstick, I think. Nasty, sour taste, but it's edible. Nibbled a little. Slept again. Ate some more. Pair of stegosaurs grazing not far away, tiny eyes fastened on me. Smaller dinosaurs holding a kind of conference by some big sickets. And Bertha Brachiosaurus munching away in Ostrom Meadow, benignly supervising the whole scene. This is absolutely crazy. I think the dinosaurs are taking care of me. But why would they do that? 2 September, 0900 hours. No doubt of it at all. They bring me eggs, meat, even cichid cones and tree fern fronds. At first, they delivered things only when I slept. But now they come hopping right up to me and dump things at my feet. The strithiomimids are the bearers. They're the smallest, most agile, 
quickest hands. They bring their offerings, stare me right in the eye, pause as if waiting for a tip. Other dinosaurs watching from the distance. This is a coordinated effort. I am the center of all activity on the island, it seems. I imagine that even the tyrannosaurs are saving choice cuts for me. Hallucination? Fantasy? Delirium of fever? I feel lucid. The fever is abating. I'm still too stiff and weak to move very far, but I think I'm recovering from the effects of my fall. With a little help from my friends. Ten hundred hours. Played back the last entry. Thinking it over. I don't think I've gone insane. If I'm sane enough to be worried about my sanity, how crazy can I be? Or am I just fooling myself? There's a terrible conflict between what I think I perceive going on here and what I know I ought to be perceiving. Fifteen hundred hours. A long, strange dream this afternoon. I saw all the dinosaurs standing in the meadow. And they were connected to one another by gleaming threads, like the telephone lines of olden times, and all the threads centered on Bertha, as if she's the switchboard, yes. And telepathic messages were traveling through her to the others, an extrasensory hookup. Powerful pulses moving along the lines. I dreamed that a small dinosaur came to me and offered me a line, and in pantomime showed me how to hook it up. And a great flood of delight went through me as I made the connection. And when I plugged it in, I could feel the deep and heavy thoughts of the dinosaurs, the slow, rapturous philosophical interchanges. When I woke, the dream seemed bizarrely vivid, strangely real. The dream ideas lingering as they sometimes do. I saw the animals about me in a new way, as if this is not just a zoological research station, but a Community, a settlement, the sole outpost of an alien civilization, an alien civilization native to Earth.、Oh, come off it! These animals have minute brains. They spend their days chomping on greenery, except for the ones that chomp on other dinosaurs. Compared with dinosaurs, cows and sheep are downright geniuses. I can hobble a little now. Three September, o six hundred hours. The same dream again last night. The universal telepathic linkage. Sense of warmth and love flowing from dinosaurs to me. And once more, I found fresh tyrannosaur eggs for breakfast. Five September, eleven hundred hours. I'm making a fast recovery. Up and about, still creaky, but not much pain left. They still feed me. Though the struthiomimids remain the bearers of food, the bigger dinosaurs now come close too. A stegosaur nuzzled up to me like some Goliath-sized pony, and I petted its rough, scaly flank. The Diplodocus stretched out flat and seemed to beg me to stroke its immense neck. If this is madness, so be it. There's a community here, loving and temperate. Even the predatory carnivores are part of it. Eaters and eaten are aspects of the whole, yin and yang. Riding around in our sealed modules, we could never have suspected any of this. They are gradually drawing me into their communion. I feel the pulses that pass between them. My entire soul throbs with that strange new sensation. My skin tingles. They bring me food of their own bodies, their flesh, and unborn young. And they watch over me and silently urge me back to health. Why? For sweet charity's sake? I don't think so. I think they want something from me. More than that, I think they need something from me. What could they need from me? Six September, oh six hundred hours. All this night, I have moved slowly through the forest. In what I can only term an ecstatic state, vast shapes, humped, monstrous forms, barely visible by dim glimmer, came and went about me. Hour after hour, I walked unharmed, feeling the communion intensify. I wandered, 
barely aware of where I was until at last, exhausted, I have come to rest here on this mossy carpet. And in the first light of dawn, I see the giant form of the great Brachiosaur standing like a mountain on the far side of Owen River. I am drawn to her. I could worship her. Through her vast body surge powerful currents. She is the amplifier. By her are we all connected, the holy mother of us all. From the enormous mass of her body emanate potent healing impulses. I'll rest a little while. Then I'll cross the river to her. All nine hundred hours. We stand face to face. Her head is fifteen meters above mine. Her small eyes are unreadable. I trust her. And I love her. Lesser brachiosaurs have gathered behind her on the riverbank. Farther away are dinosaurs of half a dozen other species, immobile, silent. I am humble in their presence. They are representatives of a dynamic superior race, which but for a cruel cosmic accident would rule the earth to this day. And I am coming to revere them, to bear witness to their greatness. Consider, they endured for a hundred forty million years in ever-renewing vigor. They met all evolutionary challenges, except the one of a sudden and catastrophic climactic change against which nothing could have protected them. They multiplied and proliferated and adapted, dominating land and sea and air, covering the globe. Our own trifling, contemptible ancestors were nothing next to them. Who knows what these dinosaurs might have achieved if that crashing asteroid had not blotted out their light? What a vast irony. Millions of years of supremacy ended in a single generation by a chilling cloud of dust. But until then, the wonder, the grandeur. Only beasts, you say? How can you be sure? We know just a shred of what the Mesozoic was really like. Just a slice. Literally, the bare bones. The passage of a hundred million years can obliterate all traces of civilization. Suppose they had language. Poetry. Mythology, philosophy, love, dreams, aspirations. No, you say, they were beasts, ponderous and stupid, that lived mindless, bestial lives. And I reply that we puny, hairy ones have no right to impose our own values on them. The only kind of civilization we can understand is the one we have built. We imagine that our own trivial accomplishments are the determining case that computers and spaceships and broiled sausages are such miracles that they place us at evolution's pinnacle. But now I know otherwise. Humans have done marvelous, even incredible things, yes. But we would never have existed at all had this greatest of races been allowed to live to fulfill its destiny. I feel the intense love radiating from the titan that looms above me. I feel the contact between our souls steadily strengthening and deepening. The last barriers dissolve, and I understand at last. I am the chosen one. I am the vehicle. I am the bringer of rebirth, the beloved one, the necessary one. Our Lady of the Sauropods am I, the Holy One, the Prophetess, the Priestess. Is this madness? Then it is madness, and I embrace it. Why have we small hairy creatures existed at all? I know now. It is so that through our technology we could make possible the return of the Great Ones. They perished unfairly. Through us, they are resurrected aboard this tiny globe in space. I tremble in the force of the need that pours from them. I will not fail you, I tell the great sorrow pods before me. And the sorrow pods send my thoughts reverberating to all the others. 20 September, 0600 hours. The 30th day. The shuttle comes from Habitat Vronsky today to pick me up and deliver the next researcher. I wait at the transit lock. Hundreds of dinosaurs wait with me each close beside the next. 
Both the lions and the lambs gathered quietly, their attention focused entirely on me. Now the shuttle arrives, right on time, gliding in for a perfect docking. The airlocks open. A figure appears, Sarber himself, coming to make sure I didn't survive the meltdown, or else to finish me off. He stands, blinking in the entry passage, gaping at the throngs of placid dinosaurs arrayed in a huge semicircle around the naked woman who stands beside the wreckage of the mobile module. For a moment, he is unable to speak. Anne, he says finally, what in God's name? You'll never understand, I tell him. I give the signal. Belshazzar rumbles forward. Sarber screams and whirls and sprints for the airlock, but a stegosaur blocks the way. No, Sarber cries as the Tyrannosaur's mighty head swoops down. It is all over in a moment. Revenge. How sweet. And this is only the beginning. Habitat Vronsky lies just 120 kilometers away. Elsewhere in the Lagrange Belt are hundreds of other habitats ripe for conquest. The Earth itself is within easy reach. I have no idea yet how it will be accomplished, but I know it will be done, and done successfully, and I will be the instrument of which it is done. I stretch forth my arms to the mighty creatures that surround me. I feel their strength, their power, their harmony. I am one with them and they with me. The great race has returned and I am its priestess. Let the small hairy ones tremble. Copyright 1996 Dove Audio Incorporated. If you would like to receive a Dove Audio or Dove Kids catalog, please call 1-800-328-3683 or 1-800-328-DOVE.